All right, so this is gonna be the third video for our uh, review session. And this is gonna be uh, our beginning to talk about neurotransmitters. And we left off last time talking about synaptic vesicle recycling. Um, with each specific neurotransmitter, there's gonna be a, a very specific vesicle associated protein that traffics that neurotransmitter into the synaptic vesicle. And there's even some neurotransmitters that don't even need synaptic vesicles. We're not going to go into that too much, but um, just know that they exist. The primary events in synaptic signaling are, um, are relevant to our discussion of neurotransmitters. But before we talk about those, those events, we want to kind of define some general fates of neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters can, can end up doing one of three things, usually a combination of the three. Number one, I mean, they're, they're released, right? But once they're released, they can either bind to postsynaptic receptors, oops, synaptic receptors. They can be reuptaken by um, glial cells. I should say, I should be more specific here. Reuptaken by astrocytes, or even in some cases, the presynaptic neuron itself, or they can be degraded. These two processes, reuptake and degradation, kind of go hand in hand. Some neurotransmitters are regulated by Reuptake, some are regulated by degradation. But the point, the, the reason you do this, the reason you reuptake neurotransmitters, the reason you degrade neurotransmitters, is to decrease the concentration of neurotransmitters at the cleft. Um, if the concentration, I should write this down, if the concentration of neurotransmitter at the synaptic cleft is too high, the postsynaptic receptors receptors are more likely to be desensitized the postsynaptic receptors are more likely to be desensitized so when a neurotransmitter binds to a postsynaptic receptor it doesn't just bind and then stay there it binds for a little bit has its effect but then it kind of pops off and we know that each um, neurotransmitter receptor usually requires at least two neurotransmitters to bind um, even glutamate receptors can sometimes bind up to four neurotransmitters but essentially what this means is that in order to reset our neurotransmitter receptor after it's bound to neurotransmitter we have to completely clear all those binding sites. And because there's two binding pockets, if the concentration of neurotransmitter at the cleft is too high, there's always gonna be a, a pretty good probability that at least one of those receptor sites is bound, right? Because even if one pops off, maybe there's still one bound, but by the time that one's ready to come off, another one has already bound to the other binding site or one of the other four binding sites. So by regulating the concentration um, in the of neurotransmitter in the synaptic cleft, we're allowing those receptors to reset and we're allowing them to overcome their desensitization that occurs after they have mediated their effect and they're just sitting there still bound to those neurotransmitters. So that's the reason we reuptake. That's the reason we degrade. Different um, neurotransmitters, again, use different mechanisms for this, but the effect or the overall result is the same. So we can kind of categorize neurotransmitters in different classes. I'm not going to do that for you right now because that's just, that's like Googleable material. What I do want to talk about though is what, like where neurotransmitters are made. So neurotransmitters in general are made within neurons. Precursors to these neurotransmitters are trafficked 
into the neurons. And it's often within the synaptic terminal itself. How do you spell neurons? Jeez. It's often within the synaptic terminal itself that the, there exist enzymes that take those precursors and turn them into the, the mature form of those neurotransmitters. For example, um, something like, oh God, I'm gonna mess this up, but what, well, I'll talk about this in, in the next video about the, the specific enzymes that are involved. But essentially, you need enzymes within the synaptic terminal to take those precursors and turn them into the, the functional neurotransmitter. For example, um, for somebody who has Parkinson's disease, oftentimes what they want to do is increase the amount of dopamine in certain synapses in their brain. And they can't do this by giving the brain dopamine or by giving the person dopamine because dopamine actually isn't trafficked across this blood-brain barrier. The, the brain does this for a reason, right? It wants to be able to control the production of neurotransmitters. If you allowed pretty much anything into the brain, you would have a real problem because glutamate is a pretty common amino acid. And it's also the most excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. So anytime you're eating any kind of protein, you're getting a ton of glutamate in your diet. Like anytime you eat a steak or like a burger or uh, nuts or whatever has a bunch of protein in it. So that glutamate, if it could get straight into your brain across your blood-brain barrier, would be a real problem if it could then have its excitatory effect, right? Essentially, you'd have a seizure every time you eat a hamburger. So the brain has had has developed in such a way to where it doesn't let neurotransmitters into the brain, it lets precursors into the brain and then turns them into neurotransmitters. And what that also allows for is you to be able to regulate where those neurotransmitters are being made and what synapses they're actually getting into. And this is most apparent with catecholamine um, or catecholaminergic neurons. These are neurons, so catecholamine neurotransmitters Um, the things, the three we care about are dopamine, norepinephrine, which is the same as noradrenaline, and epinephrine. If a presynaptic terminal has no, uh, okay, obviously it has some enzymes. If it has no enzymes that convert dopamine into anything, that's going to be a dopaminergic neuron, right? Dopamine is turned into norepinephrine by an enzyme. Let's call this enzyme A. It doesn't really matter what it's called for our purposes. Dopamine is converted to norepinephrine, and then via a different enzyme, norepinephrine is converted to epinephrine. So this is enzyme B. So if I'm a presynaptic terminal, and I contain neither of these enzymes, neither enzyme A or enzyme B, I'm going to be a dopaminergic neuron, right? Because I'm going to be producing dopamine, I'm going to be trafficking dopamine into synaptic vesicles, and then leading to their release. If I then express enzyme A within the synaptic terminal, I'm going to be a norepinephrinergic neuron or a noradrenergic neuron. So if I have enzyme A, I'm going to be a noradrenergic neuron. And if I have enzyme A and enzyme B, I'm going to be just an adrenergic neuron. And so this, I hope, kind of gets across the point that the the neurotransmitter composition that defines a certain neuron, right, is this a glutamatergic neuron, is this a GABAergic neuron, is going to be defined by the specific enzymes it has within its synaptic terminal, or um, sometimes it's elsewhere. But this is going to be what's referred to as the rate-limiting step. So the rate-limiting step of neurotransmitter synthesis. And there's a huge um, table that we give you that says the rate limiting step in neurotransmitter synthesis. And this is what they mean by that. What we're basically asking you is what is the enzyme that makes this neurotransmitter from its precursors? Um, 
if I was to rewrite that table, I would say uh, like enzyme that makes this neurotransmitter, but they call it the rate limiting step in synthesis. And then when we talk about, you know, going back to that table, the removal mechanism, we have things like acetylcholine esterase for acetylcholine. That's going to be degrading acetylcholine. We have transporters for glutamate and GABA. And then we don't actually ask you to know any, any of the other ones. We're going to kind of in detail go through acetylcholine, glutamate, and GABA transmission, just so you all understand, like, the the basic mechanism for those three neurotransmitters, both their postsynaptic effect, their precursors, how they're synthesized, and how they're removed. But the kind of last thing I want to talk about in this first neurotransmitter lecture is this idea that neurotransmitters don't inherently know what effect they have. And that's anthropomorphizing a little bit, but what I mean to say is that the effect of a neurotransmitter is determined by the activity of the receptor. Activity of the receptor that the neurotransmitter binds to. The best example of this is serotonin, right? Everyone always says, oh, I need more serotonin in my brain. I need more serotonin. Serotonin inherently doesn't have any effect. Your brain, your serotonin isn't sitting there giving any kind of instructions to your neurons beyond the fact that it binds to receptors. Those receptors actually are what mediate the effect of the serotonin. And there's about a million different things that serotonin can do in the brain because there's about... I don't know the exact number, but there's a, a bunch of serotonin receptors. Some of them are coupled to G-alpha-I pathways. Some of them are coupled to G-alpha-S pathways. Um, some of them are ionotropic. Some of them are, you know, there, there's a whole mess of different things that can occur as a function of serotonin. And to say that serotonin is the most important factor there is a gross oversimplification. So a lot of times you hear that in a, Popular culture has kind of picked up on serotonin as being ooh, like the, the happiness drug or the calm drug or whatever people are saying about it. That has nothing to do with serotonin itself, and it has everything to do with the receptors that serotonin is binding and the effect of those receptors. That's a really important idea that I want you all to kind of start thinking about. There are these claims that are made about neurotransmitters pretty often that can be kind of dangerous, like... Um, you need more dopamine in your brain, you need more oxytocin, you know, people say oxytocin is the love drug. Well, not only is that not really very well understood, but the, the experiment that originated that idea was in prairie voles, not humans. So you need to start being skeptical of the claims people are making about neurotransmitters. It's very, very rare. In fact, I can't think of a good example in which one neurotransmitter has only one effect and only does one thing and only binds to one type of receptor and only leads to one postsynaptic event. There's a huge number of different things that can occur as a function of different neurotransmitters. Um, and then when we talk about, I guess the last thing I want to talk about in this is, is a neurotransmitter excitatory or inhibitory? And again, that is going to depend on the postsynaptic receptor. We define neurotransmitters as excitatory or inhibitory because there are some kind of generalizations we can make about that. For example, we say acetylcholine is usually excitatory. That's not to say that there's not probably a case out there where it's inhibitory. That's just to say that when we talk about the effect of acetylcholine, we're talking about the most common effect, which is nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And those are going to be excitatory because they, when they open, they allow sodium in and all the stuff you know about excitatory neurotransmission. Uh, for example, GABA and glycine are going to let chloride in. So yeah. Um, and then we're going to go next to talk about the three different neurotransmitter cycles we want you to know.